Bad on Bears fans, another edition of the Chicago Bears podcast coming your way. Pat the designer, we got Erica Strowski. Oh, wait, I did point the right way. In the building, producer of the Chicago Bears podcast. And he's got six what ifs heading into the season around the Chicago Bears. We got to get into those, break all of those down, get in depth with what's going to happen to this team heading into the season. Of course, drop your questions because we got the, uh, the the mailbag tomorrow. So drop your questions in the comments below as well. We'll answer those tomorrow. Stay tapped in with us, man. Appreciate you guys tuning in. Hit that like button. Subscribe to the page. Leave that five-star review. Y'all know what to do. EO back from a nice little vacay. How you doing, my guy? I'm good. A little fun in the sun. Some family time. I will confirm your go mailbag episode tomorrow. Sweet. FYI fans out there, this is me telling Pat too for the first time, <laughs> confirm that your goes in tomorrow. That's how this works. I'm curious. Um, yeah, so on my time off, I was thinking about a few what if questions, and I thought of a six pack of questions here. I'm gonna fire at you, Pat. And we'll start with my first two are both Caleb based, because obviously, why wouldn't we start with Caleb? Not to. Uh, we'll start with the negative one. So, Ooh. what if Caleb just falls flat on his face? He's a bottom five quarterback turnover issues issues in and out of the huddle what if it's a mess i think in a in a rookie season you you get a lot of leeway right and and a lot of what if it's a mess will be tied to what we see from the quarterback that we let go as well if justin fields gets an opportunity to play which you know according to madden he's returning kickoffs ladies and gentlemen yeah i mean which everybody by the way side note calm down guys it's madden that's what you're supposed to do with players like that when you have them on your roster his break tackle is ridiculously high his speed is ridiculous there's a new kickoff rule that's going to make returning kickoffs a lot easier probably this season it's okay that they put him there i used to put devin hester at running back because he had a 99 speed like everybody relax breathe a little bit but uh I, I think that it's a lot tied to what we see from the other quarterback that you ended up letting go, but it would be concerning, right? Because you're, you're talking about falling flat on your face with a team that seems like it would be fairly, I I'm kind of getting comfortable into the NFL easier because I've got Keenan Allen. I've got DJ Moore. I've got Roma Dunze. I've got Deandre Swift. I've got Cole command. I've got Gerald Everett, right? You've got all these weapons on this team it would be very concerning if you saw him fall flat on his face. But I think my concern would probably go more towards the fact that now I'm looking at the coaching staff even closer, right? If Caleb falls flat on his face, because the talent is there. If Caleb falls flat on his face, now I'm like, okay, something with Matt Eberflus is not developing on the offensive side. Something that Shane Waldron is doing is not working on the offensive side. We have problems here with the coaching staff more than I would look at Caleb Williams in year one and feel like he kind of failed in that situation. That's interesting. Cause like, I don't know if there's been a, a quarterback in this town for sure, but a rookie that has this pressure on him because we believe this just team's window is open. We believe that they are a well-rounded team. They've got talent on offense. We think that defense is potentially a top five defense. So the way that you say like, and Caleb has the talent, that's what everyone tells us. That's what we've kind of seen at the mini camps. So I kind of agree now that you talk me into it is that something else has to be the issue then. that that yeah. you know what I mean something else within within his teachings within what they're telling him or how they're talking to him is the problem. So that's that's an interesting one. We'll go to the flip side. What if Caleb Williams is a top 10 top 12 quarterback out of the gate CJ Stroud plus type season? He's the greatest quarterback in Chicago Bears history. Dub it rookie year. Like, like honestly, like that. That's that's how bad it's been in this town. Like the the, the positives on this. And again, I keep saying this. I hope that Caleb Williams has talked about very much like a Brock Purdy, right? Well, he had all these weapons. Of course, he was great. That means that we're doing something right offensively in this town for for a long time. But yeah, to me, if Caleb Williams is what he's projected to be or he is what people believe he I mean listen you ask Nick Wright he's already a top five quarterback in the NFL which is impressive to see uh but I, I think that you're talking about leaving year one with Caleb Williams being dubbed the greatest thing since sliced bread that's ever been in a Chicago Bears uniform on the offensive side of the football and that's not that's not a crazy thing to say it's not even a crazy assumption right if he throws 
30 touchdowns and 4,000 plus yards, he's broken every quarterback record that we have in this city. And by the way, that's not an anomaly of a season for quarterbacks in the modern era of football. That's not a crazy season for quarterbacks in 2024. Like, I, I think that it would give Bears fans a lot of confidence in what this offense can become. Uh, I think on the flip side of that, though, you probably finish out this season trying to figure out who's your next offensive coordinator because Shane Waldron will 110% have a head coaching job heading into 2025 because we know how it is in this city. You give somebody a quarterback or you, you get close to fixing a quarterback, you're going to get two or three jobs probably for the next five years. Heck, we saw Adam Gase get two runs at it. He was horrible in both stops. So I, I, I a hundred percent think that if Caleb Williams meets all of the, the pressure put upon him meets all of the successes, um, not only I, I'll say this too, not only is the Chicago bears window open for the future, but I think if, if he hits on all cylinders this season, don't be surprised if the Chicago Bears are a deep playoff team. Don't be surprised if the Chicago Bears are a NFC championship team, not just because of Caleb Williams, but because of the defense that you have. You don't need to do that much offensively. I, I do believe in this defense that much coming into the season. Because of the defense that you have on the field, I think that if you have a team that could put up 24 plus points a game, you're going to win more games than you're going to lose. Now being in the playoffs for the first time, that'll be, you know, a test for a lot of the players on the field, but I wouldn't be surprised if, if Caleb Williams is 4,000 plus 30 touchdown quarterback, if we're talking about the Chicago bears making a deep playoff run this season. That's where I agree. I think the biggest, like in this scenario, when Caleb or if Caleb succeeds and he's that top 10 guy, I think the Bears are pretty much automatically in that conversation with the Niners, Eagles, and Lions in the NFC. Yeah. I think they're already there and they're already having conversations if Caleb's that good and if Caleb is the best quarterback in the NFC. As we know, the NFC doesn't have those quarterbacks. Yeah. So I think if he has that season, the ceiling for the team is like you said, NFC championship plus. Yeah, no. I, and that's, that's, that's the funny thing about it, right? Like it, it's not even, yes, the pressure's on Caleb. Yes. He's got to figure it out, but we've seen this and this is why, right. I, I a little, took a little jab at Nick, right. But realistically speaking, right. He, he talked about where Caleb ranks, uh, and that he's a top five quarterback coming into this league. And he's basing that off of the things that we've seen. The other Four quarterbacks that I think he had on that list were Patrick Mahomes, CJ Stroud. Uh, I think Josh Allen was on there. And then there was one other uh, Jalen Hurts. I would hope maybe Joe Who? Burrow. Joe Burrow was the other one. Joe Burrow was the, was the other one that was on there. You look at three of the four names on that list outside of Josh Allen. All three of those guys did what he expects Caleb Williams to do. CJ Stroud came in and Boom. Second that he got on the field, he was a hit. The offense worked. Pat Mahomes comes in. Of course, the team that he had around him was phenomenal. But second he gets on the field, they're, they're winning a Super Bowl, right? Joe Burrow comes in. First year, snaps his leg in half because, you know, same problem that he's got. Still no offensive line. Second year, he gets his boy Jamar Chase out there with him. And now all of a sudden, they're in the Super Bowl. So, it's funny to like when you hear top five for a quarterback that young, you instantly go, there's no way that could ever happen. But the top five guys that he has four, three of those five guys have done exactly what we hope Caleb Williams can do. And all three of them have, except for CJ Stroud have made a Super Bowl. So all those quarterbacks, if you like, I think it's rare for a top five quarterback to not excel in that rookie year to where they're already yeah. in that conversation and pushed up to that top 10. So your examples of those guys that are in the top five were dudes after season one and season two were like, yeah, this guy's real. Yeah. So like if Caleb is to vaunt himself to that spot, we pretty much need to see it this year. Yeah, you need to see something of that, right? right. I mean, Josh Josh Allen is in there and we, we know the history of Josh Allen, right? What was it three... His yeah, third year, three, year, I think year he three was his big all of a sudden. I found out how to be accurate year. Yeah. And year one and two were god awful. Like he was like I don't know if people remember this, but like he was a dumb quarterback. Mm -hmm. Like it wasn't that he didn't have talent, but literally, like I remember I think his second year they ended up making the playoffs. 
and he breaks a run to the outside and it's like okay like if you just like get out of bounds there you can win this game you like you put yourself in a position i think it would have been a field goal to win this game and he tries to like freaking lateral the football to somebody and it ends up being a fumble they lose the game i want to say it was versus the patriots if i'm not mistaken but it's just like dude what did you just do like you could have won this game if you were just smart and in year three, all of a sudden, he was the smart guy. He was the he had better weapons as well. But he but all of a sudden, right, like he he's the game clicks for him. So like it's not to say that you can't get there eventually. But like you said, for most of those top five guys, like it did quick, it did click pretty quickly, right? And Joe Burrow, his problem, we knew what his problem was: terrible offensive line, lack of weapons. They got they got him the best weapon they could. They kind they didn't really improve the offensive line. It's still bad, but he's he's just that good, right? Like, could you imagine Joe Burrow behind a good offensive line? That'd be nuts. Oh but I just think that when you look at uh, um, how, what Caleb Williams has to show in year one and how like how confident it would be, I do want to see how year two goes for C.J. Stroud. But there's not a lot of doubt that he's going to be able to do a lot of the things that he did in year one. Agreed, agreed. All right, so my next two questions in our six-pack here are both health-related and uh, defense-related. So the first okay. one is Montez Sweat stays healthy all year, mm. but Ryan Poles, what if Ryan Poles never fills that other bookend pass rush position? <sighs> I'm, I'm, I've said this a couple of times. Now, it depends on how D-Walk is playing. But I'm okay going into the season with what we currently have. The reason for that being is we saw what we currently have improve in the second half of that season last year when Montez Sweat showed up. I, I understand that every, we want to have every position filled and, and that it's so uber important to have that pass rusher opposite of, of Montez Sweat. But it's the, the more important piece is Javon Dexter. The more important piece is that three technique working because that three technique being better, Javon Dexter stepping up and taking on that mantle to me makes Demarcus Walker better, makes Montez sweat that much better because now you're pushing, you're pushing that pocket in, you're forcing pressure, you're forcing a quarterback to have to make a quicker decision. I believe that you already have a top five DB unit in the NFL, so that's going to create turnovers there. Uh, to me, I, honestly, I believe you have the best DB unit in the NFL, but the, you know the, the, that can be debated by people uh, uh, in the comments and stuff. But to me, outside of that, if you're creating that pressure up the middle and you're forcing a quarterback to have to get on the move, get up on his horse, now you're running guys into Demarcus Walker, into Montez Sweat. My focus is more on the three technique position than anything. I'd be okay with you entering the season and not filling that spot. Now, if Demarcus Walker just looks god awful out there, yeah, you probably need to go out and fill that spot. And, and we may have conversations on that as we get through the season. But where it stands right now, I'm okay with the roster that the defense has. Like to me, if you re-sign Yannick Ngakwe or uh, Calais Campbell's already off the board, if you go out and get Emmanuel Agba, right? Like you're. Yannick is is better, but you're kind of going out and getting guys that are D walk anyway. Like Yannick is definitely better than Demarcus Walker is, but outside of that, right? You, they also have to pay the rookies. You you got to have guys on a discount. Outside of going out and getting Unique, I guess, who's also not going to be out there on rundown, so D-Walk's going to be out there anyway. You're kind of just getting that same guy. There's no game changer out there right now for me that I think puts the Bears in a good position. I think if we get through the entire season and it kind of looked how it ended with last season with the defense being a dominant defense and Montez yeah. Sweat balling, but clear a hole, like clearly a hole on that other side with some sort of pass rush and pressure, I think if there's by the end, if we get through the whole season and Ryan Poles didn't pull off any trades or find somebody and a year left in their deal that come over. Yeah. I think that tells you that Ryan Poles believes this team's still a year away to making a run. Mm. I think if he believes this team can make that deep run, he'll do what it takes to make that second pass rush to make that defense even harder to play against deep in the playoffs. But see, I think what's, what's tough, now listen, having a great pass rush is phenomenal, but with the DB unit you have, right, I would love to have the sack numbers because sacks mean you're going backwards, you're bumping the quarterback, you're, you're, you're throwing him off his game a little bit. But to me, the pressure, 
is the most important thing. And, and the Bears were able to create more of that last season towards the end of the year. And that's what led to a lot of those turnovers, right? To me, if you're getting the pressure, if you're getting those turnovers, I would feel more comfortable with riding out this season. And I don't think that it's a lack of commitment to them, but realistically speaking, right, you're also coming into another draft where you'll have three picks in your first two rounds. Uh, you'll be able to address the edge position where there's edges actually in this draft, that a lot of edges in this upcoming draft that I think that you can go out there and get. You're building younger through your defense, right? Like, I don't think everything has to be the veteran guy who's the best option at that spot. I think you probably are saying, okay, we had good enough at that position. The defense as a whole, right, if it finishes out, like you said, last season, they're getting takeaways. That That's the goal of, of on, being on defense. Put yourself in the other position. If we're getting the takeaways, I'm I'm okay with riding out this season. Now, if there's no takeaways coming, if, if we're not getting enough pressure on the quarterback, that's very different if he does nothing then. I think that that's more telling, but I, I don't know if like, I, I think there's like with Ryan Poles with everything, there's a lot of future planning that goes into Ryan Poles decision-making. I did a video on the breeze um, yesterday or two days ago about all of Ryan Poles trades and like, which were the three best trades. And we'll probably do something like that over here as well. But it literally was every trade had a pick in it or a player in it that touched another trade. So he's very future thinking. And it, it's when you break it down and look through it, it's very dope to see like, oh, this mug is like flipping picks left and right. He's He's got the answers here. So I don't know if it means that he doesn't have the confidence in this team making a deep run more so than, hey, we also got to continue to build this team moving forward, get as far as you can this year. We'd love to win a Super Bowl. But, you know, there's still some growing pains that this team has to go through. Perfect. And you kind of lead me into what would that be? Our fourth question in our six pack here of what ifs is man what if these dbs are healthy all season long Ooh, i just said man. it. Dog. i just said it dog this is the best but uh uh let me let me look let me open my notes here real quick because uh i have the full 53 the the athletic did the 53 man projection uh, let's see if my notes will even open. Like no, the notes app was being weird the other day. Um, the doing the full 53 man projection of what the bears roster is. And the most exciting part about this group of DBs that we have here is that, okay, it's not showing up. Oh, maybe it's in here. Hold on. Yeah, here it is. Uh, be, even when you get to the third and fourth guy, you still see guys that can make an impact. Here's here's the they got they're keeping seven cornerbacks, five safeties. This is Adam Johns and and uh, um, Kevin Fishbane uh, from the Athletic did this list. Jalen Johnson, Tyree Stevenson, Kyler Gordon. Those are your top three. Kevin Bayard, Jaquan Brisker. Those are your top five DBs that are going to be on the field most of the time. Even when you get to the backups, so there are names in there that made an impact. Josh Blackwell, Terrell Smith, Jalen Jones, Greg Stroman Jr., Jonathan Owens at safety, Elijah Hicks at safety. Right, like you, you're going through Jonathan Owens, a guy we brought over this season who is a tackle machine, right? So like um, you're, you're looking at guys to me at a unit to me, I should say that even if right, when you bring in the backups to the guys, you're still looking at a top DB unit in this league. And it's, it's impressive how they built this out. It's impressive. Their focus to DBs at flu streets, DBs like running backs. He's like, you can never have enough. You can guarantee we're going to look at some DB out there that we're going to add to this team. Um, I, I love how they put this team together. It like, like your says, it's a little bit backwards. It's a little bit right. Flipped around. But if you're creating pressure, these guys are getting the ball. And I think that's the part that's the most important, right? The interception numbers, like can the bears lead this? What was that? The 2020 numbers that the, the bears, uh, that that's their goal here. 20 interceptions, 20 fumbles. This is a unit that can accomplish that. I just think that. If they're healthy, I don't know how much of the argument's going to be out there about a better secondary crew. I think if they're healthy, this defense will flourish. Yeah. And as we know, they are braggadocious and loud and fun. I think this city, by the end of the season, if they stay healthy, 
will love Jaquan Brisker and like get to know him even more than they do. I think those guys have an opportunity because that unit has an opportunity to be so damn good. Yeah, they can become stars in this city. Oh, a hundred percent. And and listen, we, as much as we talk about um how good Caleb could be, how good this offense could be, and all of that, we know what we're built on. We know what we love, right? We want to see hard hitting defenses. We want to see takeaways. We want to see the turnovers. We just like those turnovers to then turn into touchdowns on the other side, something that we didn't do enough of last season. To me, like your if this DB unit can stay healthy, not only would they be stars in this city, but they would be iconic uh, uh, in Bears history. Like, I think it's that good of a defensive unit that the city's looking to fall in love with. The city wants to fall in love with. And Jalen Johnson being the face of that, right? Like, you you add in Kevin Bayard, who to me is is a great get this offseason. Maybe a little expensive, but a great get. Um Jaquan and Kyler are both just fun guys, right? Stop flipping, Kyler. I don't like my my biggest fear is that he's gonna do a backflip and the ACL is gonna go. Stop just flipping. Pop. I, I don't need to see no flips this year. Um, but even right, like you've got like the finesse, you've got the guys breaking, breaking up the 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 passes and stuff like that. And Jalen Johnson, Kyler Gordon. Then you got your hard hitting dude that you know is gonna be involved in every play and Tyree Stevenson. Yeah. Right. You got your dude that's going to lay the wood and, and Jaquan Brisker. Right. Like, so you've got the perfect mix of guys for them to become stars in this town. I think Tyreek might end up being my favorite dude of that class of, of that group just because of the, the physicalness he plays with. He right. hits like a truck. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> and he looks for it. He loves it. Um, yeah. Same question. Other side of the ball. What if these three wide receivers, DJ Moore, Keenan Allen and Roma Dunze stay healthy? All season. I think you're talking about a lot of yards. I think you the the I'm telling you, we I said this on the breeze. I'm, I'm gonna say it here. We gotta find us a cognac sponsor because that's what it's gonna be a lot of this season if they stay healthy all year. A lot of yak. Uh seeing Roma Dunze run. I mean, my guy, he is a physical specimen. It, that's what's funny about like how good Caleb is. Like if Caleb, me and Dion talked about this, right? Like if Caleb wasn't here, we'd be gushing over Rome. Like he's that good. He he's he's literally Chase Claypool's build, but good. <laughs> you know what I mean? But like high points of football. Uh, it will go up and get the 50-50 ball. Is aggressive on the run. Is a monster uh fighting through contact and stuff like that. Like I think that when you look at the fact that almost all three of you guys, I guess Keenan Allen, when Keenan Allen is your most finesse guy on the team, you got some dogs out there. Like DJ Moore fighting through the contest. There's going to be so much yak this year. There's going to be so much yak. That's going to be the definition of this offense. I mean, I think that Caleb, there's, there's going to be times where like, again, the criticism of Caleb Williams will be like uh, uh, Brock Purdy or like uh, um Tua last season, right? Where it was, well, you know, he threw it eight yards, but then they took it 90. It was like, well, yeah, yeah. There's going to be a lot of yards because of that to me if this if this unit stays healthy all year. And I'll say this, if this unit stays healthy all year, the Chicago Bears offense as a whole will be something that the team can finally lean on. That's something we haven't seen since. B Marsh and Alshon Jeffrey, right? Where it's like we can actually like rely on this offense versus hoping that this offense shows up. I think if those three guys stay healthy all year, this offense has the potential and one that obviously massively helps Caleb's development. Yeah. But two, it means that this offense could be the best offense in Bears history in year one of Caleb's career, Ooh. just because of the talent yeah. and the offense and the way they move move the ball up and down. Otherwise, before that, like you said, you kind of go back to the Cutler Marshall. Alshon Jeffrey to where it was really an electric offense. And it like I like I said before, right? I said this on the show the other day when when we, again when we were talking with Dion about this. Like I love the fact that they're calling it a race to a thousand. In a race, you would assume everybody finishes the race. So it's you've got Rome, you've got DJ, you've got Keenan. They're all expecting to cross a thousand yards. They're 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 planting. I don't know if Rome does, but between Keenan and DJ, like there's an expectation that like you could have two one thousand yard receivers. You haven't had that since Cutler and Jeffrey and B Marsh. I think uh, uh, I think Jeffrey's that season had 
I want to say he had 1,200. I think B Marsh had 1,500 yards that season or something like that. Like it was, it like it's possible to see. Now, three is we've only seen that, I want to say, five or six times in history. I think the last team to do it was the Bengals that year that Chase got drafted. Um, him, T Higgins, and Tyler and Boyd all Boyd, crossing yeah, a thousand. Uh-huh. Um, I don't know if you'd be able to attain that. But I think that Rome is going to be a 800, 900 yard guy this season, or he crosses a thousand and Keenan's an 800, 900 yard guy. Like this offense all, should be dominant. Right. I think if all three are healthy, you can almost pencil in say 26, 2800 yards between the three of them. And that's, that's just amazing. That's so much fun. Easily, easily. Last question of the it. six pack. What ifs? Let's do it. What if, Shane Waldron's offense is just insanely pass heavy and they struggle to close games and different situations like that. where running the ball is important. Um, I expect it to be, I'm not going to lie to you. Mm-hmm. Like I know there's a lot of people that keep saying they got to run the ball. Rookie quarterback. J Max said this the other day, got to run the ball. Rookie quarterback. There's no way you're not running the ball. If you're not running the football, you're, you're going to put yourself in a bad spot. Shane Waldron doesn't run. He doesn't run a lot. They they had running back. They got uh, 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 Kenneth Walker out in uh, uh, Seattle. They've got they've got running backs out there that you can do a lot with, and they just don't utilize them enough. Um, and to me, I guess if you're not closing games, I'd have a problem then. But there's a lot of offenses that don't run the football a lot. The offense that just won the Super Bowl doesn't run the football a lot. The Chiefs like use Isaiah Pacheco in that cartoon run like mm-hmm. 14 times a game. You know what I mean? So it's like, it's, and I think that's why you go out and you get a DeAndre Swift because you want a guy who can be a pass catcher. You're going to use utilize kind of those, right? Those short passes as runs as well. That's just how Shane Waldron's offense is. Um, I don't think that it slows you down or stops you. I think that it makes it a little bit more difficult um, to... I guess right when you're trying to run the clock, if you drop the football and stuff like that, but that's why you go get a DeAndre Swift who's an above sixty percent uh, a pass catcher who who you can you know dump the football off to and he can make something out of nothing. Like I, I think that it doesn't hurt the Bears if they're pass heavy. In fact, I almost hope that they're a little more pass heavy than run. I don't want to see fifty fifty. I would like a fifty five forty five. That would be ideal for me. I think we may see 60 40, <laughs> but you know, that may be a little, you know, that may be a little out of whack. Um, but to me, like it's a, th- th- that offense is going to be pass heavy and you can win with that. We we've seen teams do that. Like that. It doesn't stop my expectation of the bears. Perfect. So I, if they're struggling and this is what's happening, I think Shane Waldron quickly becomes the city's punching bag. I think both Easily. media fans will quickly look to blame him before they blame Caleb or the wide receivers. I think he is the first person that has a target on his back, uh, basically because of the style of offense he wants to run and the style of offenses we've seen here our lifetime. I and well, here's here's the thing that I'll say too, though, right? It also depends on right because now everybody's got the all 22 every and everybody doesn't know what they're looking at but everybody's got the all 22 everybody's got the breakdown if we don't see anything in the middle of the field like we saw with justin fields at times right i think it makes it easier for you to become the punching bag the reason that luke getsy became the punching bag was justin did justin fields live up to the expectation 100 percent, he didn't but at the same time we could always look at luke getsy and go why'd you just run three of the same screen passes versus a super bowl level defense or four of the same screen, whatever it was. Like, why'd you just run that play four times? What was that? Like, they're, they're, the if it is illogical play calls, then I think it's easy for him to become a punching bag. But if we look at it and we're just like, listen, I understand that they're throwing the football a little much, but, like, he's got to make that throw. He's got to be able to hit that guy. He's, you know what I mean? Like, I, I think that it does – it's a two-way street, right? When there were moments where we were sitting there going – DJ Moore is open. You got to throw that football. We blame Justin Fields. We had no problem doing that. I mean, we blame the quarterback. And so now with a rookie quarterback, do you want to adjust a little bit? Because, you know, if he's 
I guess if you're forcing it and you can see it's not clicking for Caleb, then we would be like, you got to change something, dude. Like that would be when we would we would go in and and make him the punching bag very quickly versus if we see things and it's like, okay, you know, Caleb's making these passes. It's just a little inconsistent to me. Then I'd be like, well, yeah, but this is the offense that he's going to be in. You got to go out there and, and figure this out. And the only way for him to do it is by him making these passes. That's awesome. Who do you think is got the biggest spotlight on him? Is it Caleb, Flus, or Waldron? Like Waldron. Jay Waldron has like, like, he's the one that's supposed to make all this work now. Yeah, it, it's it's Waldron to me. Um, I think the Caleb Williams spotlight is huge, but to me, if we look at this offense and it looks disjointed and it looks unprepared and it looks, you know, like it looks like the offense has looked last season, I've got problems. I got problems with the coaching staff, and I had I had problems with the staff last season. That's why I didn't want Matt Eberflus to come back as the Bears' head coach. That's why I wanted us to make a change at head coach, but. Right? Flus looking a little different, coming in a little bit more confident. Okay, let's give him another shot. Let's see if he's learned from some of those mistakes because he didn't learn from the mistakes during the season because we made a mistake in week four that popped up again in week uh, 11 or 12 whenever we played freaking Detroit, right? And like the mistakes kept piling up. And, and so I think Shane Waldron has the biggest spotlight on him because you removed an entire offense. Like, it's not like you removed like, the quarterback or the play caller like you were like it all sucks get everything out of here run it all back and we're bringing in all new pieces and we're adding in more weaponry and we're adding in more wide receivers in the draft like we're going out here and we're getting everything that we can to make sure that this works so you better figure out how to call the right plays like that i think i think the biggest light is on shane waldron out of anybody I agree. And like, I feel like outside net, na like nationals, like national media, national fans don't realize, but I think here in the city, the spotlight is going to be the hardest on Shane Waldron. I really yeah. do just for what you said. Cause I think everyone's expectations are to, at a point where they haven't been in so long and we expect success. And if it doesn't happen, we believe it's going to be a coaching problem, not a roster problem. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. That's, that's kind of where there's no, I'm sorry. Like that, that's, what's funny about this, right? I remember last year watching Justin Fields and just being like, listen, you got to get your weapons open. You got to scheme something to get guys open. Like, because it was, it was like, we were looking at players that we knew were good and they were just disappearing, right? We didn't get the ball to DJ Moore for the first five weeks of the season. It was, it was, that was a talking point for the first quarter plus of the season is why does DJ Moore have four targets this yeah. week? Yeah. Yeah. Versus the Packers. He finished the game, I believe with two targets, <sighs> right? Like it, it's, it's so that to me is like, I look at Keenan. I know Keenan Allen is good. I know DJ Moore is good. I know Roma Dunze will be good, right? Like I know Cole Komet is a solid tight end to a almost, you know, above good tight end. Like he's, he's really improved himself. I know I, I've seen these guys be good. So like if all of a sudden they just start to suck, I'm looking right at the guy who's like, okay, we've seen all of them be good. What are you doing? That's making them bad. And so I, I think there's going to be a huge spotlight on Shane Wald. We'll see. We'll see. That's it. That's all I got. That was the full six pack right full there. Plus pack. a little, a little extra spotlight question at the end. I like it. Yeah. Full six pack with a little, uh, little, little shooter in there. I'm not mad at yeah, that. I'm not there mad we at go. that. Chase it down with some bourbon. Oh yeah. You got to, you got to shout out Carmen DeFalco, uh, yes, tap in on whiskey. You, uh, hit that like button, subscribe to the page, leave that five star view. Y'all know what to do. Drop your answers to the questions that we had in the comments below. And I'll respond to some of you guys as well. Uh, as long as you guys are, you know, being, being regular and, and enjoying the content and not out here while I do respond to haters. Though. I do respond to a lot of haters in the comments. Uh, hit that like button, subscribe to the page, leave that five-star review. Y'all know what to do for the producer, Eric Ostrowski. It's your boy, Pat the Designer, back at it again. Y'all stay safe out there, Chicago. Bear down, one love. Peace.